All right. Um, put on your masks, your mental seatbelts. We're going into rarefied atmosphere and deep territory. What were you doing before? <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things that occurs to me when I, is every time I deliver the class and bring stuff that was once hidden to light, that um, many people may not necessarily understand what they're seeing. And sometimes um, one of the things that we had often talked about within uh, you know, those of us who are activists and those of us who are professionals and those who are, uh, who are like in the community, like I think I might have, I was actually just having this conversation in the counseling lunchroom about what the value of a PhD is. And I said, well, if you're talking Frary, you know, it's, you're very well schooled in the whole idea of education is domestication, but you ain't got no street wisdom. So if I know a 16-year-old black female who was a drug dealer who was making $10,000 a month, how many PhDs make that? Like hustling. How many people, how many PhDs know how to live on the street if they lost their job? How, how, you know, how they could, how could they survive when, um, you know, rich people lose their money? Well, do they starve? Well, they don't starve. Why don't they starve? So what do they know that others do not? Because they're not, you know, you don't see any former millionaires on a street corner begging for cans and spare change. Right? America is so rich that people can make a living and survive off of what other people throw away. Which, you know, if you understand how, you know, canners and signers work, you know, you fly a sign, you do canning, you know, two different levels of income, but people flying sign can make up to $200 a day, which, you know, you multiply that out, what that is. You know, that's a significant piece of change. Even a junkie with a Eugene habit paying Eugene street prices for heroin, that is low, that's minimum wage for a doctor. That's 60 grand that they have to come up with often without a job to pay for their dose. You can't teach that in school, how to do that, but people have to do it. So the relative value of... A PhD versus, you know, what you have to do to survive on the street. I mean, some people may think it's apples and oranges, but, you know, that's a form of power. So, one of the things I wanted to talk about in terms of the, these elements of power is, um, you know, as you know, I'm a science fiction, you know, black nerd. So, I'm into science fiction, particularly black science fiction or science fiction involving people of color. You know, like the brother from another planet. You know, Joe Morton's done good for himself, right? Since then. Um, the Star Trek universe, you know, all those different folks. So, elements in an atmosphere of power. Now, if you've seen the movie Avatar, most of those actors are people of color. The principal actors are people of color. You got the white guy who is the you know, Marine in the wheelchair, but everybody else is either black or Latino. Or, you know, in Zoe Saldana's case, black and Latino. Right? So, <laughs> when I thought about, for example, uh, I may or may not have mentioned that the Matrix movies and the Terminator movies are basically the same story that was written by a black woman that had her story ripped off by James Cameron and you know, the people who, the Wachowski brothers. And that what she was trying to do was create a black superhero. Yeah, so maybe actually I'll bring that up in, you know, when we're formally doing the 80s and 90s so 
Like, look, let's look at that story. So the idea of what she was trying to do is she got tired of the whole pimp and the player thing. Why don't we have some black superheroes? Because back in the day, when I collected comic books, there was only one black comic book character, and that was the Black Panther out of Marvel. It was this after African chieftain, kind of like a Captain America-esque person, you know, super athletic, the Black Panther, but he was not like political necessarily, right? So Sophia Stewart basically wanted to have this whole um, black superhero thing, and she's Christian-esque, so she basically wanted to say, okay, you have the Old Testament, that's history. You have the New Testament, that's now. You have Revelations, that's the future. All right? So, cast this black person as a Messiah who's coming back from the future. Machines have taken over humanity. All right? I mean, she's writing this on a computer and she's projecting, oh, the machines get smart and they take over humanity and you have a group of rebels who basically go back in time to rescue their Messiah who's caught up in the machine world. Okay, so you have the storyline basically of the Terminator and John Connor and the storyline of Neo. Well... In her universe, Neo is John Connor. Right? So the two storylines got separated out of her, her, her book, The Third Eye, which is you know, basically, it's a spiritual quality. And she said, you know, if you notice, as long as they followed you know, her, the original book, which was not a, it's a script treatment with special effects and everything, and this is how, you know, basically she didn't necessarily get, win a lawsuit to get money. She was basically saying, yeah, the FBI agreed this was not only copyright infringement, they actually stole my book. So like the Sentinels and the Matrix, that was her thing. The whole spiritual power with, you know, Neo getting shot and, you know, if you die in the Matrix, do you actually die? And, you know, all of a sudden he comes back to life with a kiss. And, you know, in the third movie, which is, you know, they return to the script. And, you know, he's theoretically dead because he's been taken over by Agent Smith. And all of a sudden he comes back and there's this light and it floods the Matrix. And boom, everything's back to normal. She came up with all of them. She came up with all of that. Why is the Oracle a black woman? You think white guys would come up with a wise black woman? Really? Did you do the it? only reason Keanu Reeves, Keanu Reeves, as compared to an actor with Lawrence Fishburne and all those other folks, please. Really? You think he has, you know, is he a Shakespearean actor like Lawrence Fishburne? No. <laughs> okay? So they only cast him because of the whole politics of how movies are made. He had more, you know, they felt that he had more um, star power. Star power. Now, she wanted somebody like Will Smith or Blair Underwood. Okay, I'm just saying. Okay, right? They, you know, I mean, there's a whole thing about whether they were available and all that kind of stuff. But I'm just saying, all right, so this is a backstory, right, which plays like an urban legend on the internet. Oh, well, she's crazy. She's whatever, but, you know, some of the things that she's saying fit. Because she said, point it out, the Wachowski brothers, like, built sets and were doing, co you know, they're not filmmakers. I mean, okay, I like, you know, V for Vendetta, whatever. Cloud Atlas, that was interesting. Okay. But, you know. Did she turn that treatment into a studio? Yeah. Well, then she had Fox, and it got ripped off. Well, to Paramount, to she, and 20th Century Fox. She had a document that was coming. Yeah, was it she had a, yeah, oh yeah, all that. That's how the FBI ruled in her favor, but, you know, she wasn't, you know, it got kind of, you know, in order to get, because, you know, what those franchises are worth are billions. What's your name again? Sophia Stewart. Mm -hmm. And you can find it on the net, and I've actually downloaded the PDF, which is the original book and the treatment, and all the court stuff, it's called, you know, the Sophia Stewart, the mother of the Matrix. And she's living in Utah or something like that. 
Did you end up giving us the money? No. No, none? No. Oh, no. I mean, and that's an interesting thing in itself. So the only reason I mention that, right, is, you know, I'm a black science nerd. So I'm into, I study black science fiction and black writers and, you know, what do they say about our world and how do you think about certain things, right? So go to slide. Pandora. Now, the thing that I like about science fiction in particular is it's based on the science, actual science, stuff that's actually true and proven. But the fiction part comes in in telling the story. All right? So there actually are, you know, when they, they have this satellite like Kepler that's a telescope that can, that's looking for Earth-like planets, Okay? Or you watch Star Trek and, oh, Class M planet. Okay, Earth is a Class M planet. Oxygen, nitrogen, water world. That's basically what a Class M planet is. Okay, So Pandora is a moon of a gas giant, like Jupiter, except... Like Jupiter, this big gas giant, which these gas giant planets are almost stars. Okay, A star is defined by it's putting out more energy than it receives. And Jupiter and Saturn, in particular, are putting out more energy than they receive. So much, yeah, so little less, certainly more than Neptune and Uranus, which are also gas giants. But they're big enough to have their own moons that are big enough to support life if they have enough gravity in the atmosphere. And so this, you know, Pandora is called, uh, you know, it's called, the moon is called Pandora and um, the planet, its primary, the gas giant is called Polyphemus after the Greek Cyclops because of the great red great spot. On Jupiter, it's the great red spot. Here, Polyphemus, it's blue. Single eye, right? That's where that mythology came from, right? So, Pandora. So, consider the world Pandora. Class M planetoid, water world, moon of a gas giant, so all this plays into the conditions on the planet. Like, it's a moon of a gas giant, and gas giants, remember, put out more energy than receive, particularly in magnetic energy. So much so that there are incredible lightning storms and tornadoes at the poles of Pandora, which would destroy a ship, right? You don't see this necessarily in the movie. There's like book, companion books that, you know, talk about, you know, activism, because Earth, because you only see this in the, the unreleased version, if you buy the, you know, DVD, the theatrical, not the theatrical release, which is three hours long, but the 16 minute longer version that comes on the DVD set, in which you see Earth has basically been trashed. You can't breathe the atmosphere except with those breathers that you see in the movie. Right? No trees, no water, animals are extinct. They're bringing tigers back, which have been extinct for 200 years using genetic engineering. So, you know, that's why they're going to Pandora, because Earth has been trashed. And they need a new place to migrate to, and et cetera, et cetera, right? Moon of a gas giant. There's more carbon dioxide, CO2, and hydrogen sulfide, which is a product of uh, volcanism, that is volcanoes, because it's so close to its gas giant partner that there's always earthquakes and volcanoes belching all this stuff into the atmosphere. So hydrogen sulfide, that's farts, basically, for us. But the atmosphere is poisonous. You can only live in it for, you know, it won't kill you if you're wearing a breathing mask that filters out all the noxious stuff. So you can go out with bare skin, but you can't breathe it because you'll pass out in three minutes and die. 
right? As you saw in the movie, if you've seen the movie, right? What movie? Avatar. Oh. So lighter gravity, so things float easier. Stronger magnetic field, so there's greater conductivity and interspecies connectivity, which is a feature in the film. Oh, you can plug in to any other creature with these handy little nerve bundles that you have in your hair and that every other critter has, right? Or you can plug into a tree and be connected to a planet-wide interspecies net, which is made possible by greater magnetic field, therefore greater conductivity between life forms. And they don't talk about this in the film. I, I'm just saying, the science. Okay, it's the same thing that Native Americans, traditional Africans, indigenous people, that's why I'm wearing indigenous, we're connected to the planet consciously. Okay? Via not only our breath, but magnetic fields, which are measurable. Pandora is even more intense than Earth. All right, so. Remember, it's science fiction, based on, this is actual fact, but we're making a story of about it. That's not true, but the actual facts is true. All right, but there's that atmosphere. So I was talking about, thinking about, all right, how do I teach people to be powerful, especially if they're in a power vacuum? How would you know there's a power vacuum? You just feel weird. Why would you feel weird in going into a particular situation? You feel intimidated. Why do you feel intimidated going into another situation with other humans? They're wearing suits and you're not? Well, what if you dress up in a suit? So no. Right? The language of power. So, you know, like I said the other day, Dad said you need to sit at the table of power. Why, why, do I, why can I? No, you need to sit at the table. The reason you need to sit at the table is so that other people will think of you as an equal and then when you speak well and you think of things that they have never thought of that would be obvious to anybody else, but they're insulated and they got their PhDs and they think they're all smart and all that kind of stuff and you cut through that by just telling a simple, direct truth from your experience, boom. Now that can be intimidating. Wow, that's an uppity nigger there. He really knows something. No, they don't say that to my face, but that's what they think. Not just me. They're intimidated by anybody that displays intelligence. Anybody, especially females. Oh, just go back to your, you know, washing dishes and taking care of the kids. You can't be head of Google. Like that, right? So studying how power environments are constructed and then explaining it in a way that anybody could access it if you understand when you walk into this situation, some people, the, gig, the, the game is rigged before you walk in. Now being able to understand how it's rigged, you can turn the tables in your favor if you know what to look for before you go in. Because it's better to know it before you go in than discover it when they shut you out. So, elements in the atmosphere of power, right? So. The atmosphere is toxic, more CO2, hydrogen sulfide than Earth, so you have to learn to interface with those who are native to it. Now it is an oxygen-nitrogen world. The Navi breathe oxygen and they're acclimated to it. So that's why the whole genetic engineering experiment where you create an avatar. Now, an avatar has three meanings, that word. The original meaning in Sanskrit was an incarnation of God. So like Krishna, Ram, Vishnu, the Buddha, all those two folks are incarnations of God. Right? Then, with computers, an avatar became a representation of a person in cyberspace. 
right? So like you're in game in Farmville, you have your little farm, you have your little characters, or within World of Warcraft, you're an orc, or you're this, or you're that. Then Avatar became that. In this sense, they're basically saying, okay, because of the intense magnetic field, we can transmit a signal, especially if it's genetically coded to you, where we blend Navi DNA and your DNA, since you're both oxygen breathing species and your brains are similar, we can project your consciousness into this remote body that's separate. Right? And it's possible because of the intense magnetic field. Again, they don't talk about that in the movie. You have to extrapolate from the book, but well, it's done wirelessly in a thing that's like an MRI superconducting magnet, right? Which is amplifying your brain signal and projecting it into a compatible body, right? And so while you're in the avatar, you're awake, and when you close your eyes and fall asleep, you go back into your own body, right? Very similar in a sense. I don't want to get too woo-woo about this, but there is a psychological school of thought in psychology called psychosynthesis, which basically states, while you're awake, normal waking consciousness, you're in this reality. When you go to sleep and you enter the dream world, that is a separate reality, just as real, because your body reacts to it as if it was real. You know, like when you have a dream and you're flying and all of a sudden you start falling and then you fade out before you hit the rocks or, you know, you're running from the guy with a gun behind you and you're like going as fast as you can and you turn around and they're right there. See, you, you all have this experience, right? So at the basic neuronal level, the individual nerve cell, it can't tell the difference between a real event and an imagined one. So this guy, Asa Gioli, who was a contemporary of Freud and Jung, okay, Italian um, psychologist, basically said, well, what if it is real? What if there is a spiritual dimension to life and that you need a healthy sense of spirituality to maintain sanity? So he was saying it because Freud said, oh, well, if you, you know, Freud was a non-observant Jew. Oh, well, religion is essentially delusion. You know, Jung says, oh, the collective unconscious, you know, we all have this connection, you know, in dreams, there's archetypes, etc., etc. Asagioli says, uh, look, let's just say that spirituality is necessary. So he's <laughs> contemporary and homie with Freud and Jung, but nobody knows about Asagioli because you can see why spirituality is necessary for a healthy psychology and that dreams are actually real and no, people ain't going to be down with that. Because what if you started thinking that you could make your dreams happen? Well, if you think there's uh, chemical reactions. Yeah. Oh, why? Well, yeah, it's, all, it's only electrochemical reactions, right? Yeah, okay. What Whatever. What's his name? Asagioli. Roberto Asagioli. Uh, psychosynthesis. Remember in the movie when, like, when he first went to the world, and then he like drank the, drank something, or they gave him something to make them, to make him understand their language. Yeah, like, right. What did that like? Does that represent anything, or was that just in the movie? Um, it's in the, it's actually in the outtakes of the movie where he actually goes through a whole psychedelic ritual as part of his becoming, you know, a man of the Navi, and accepted within the tribe. So. There are um, psychological correlates with that in terms of some of the psychedelic rituals that are done within indigenous cultures. You know, there are people are talking about, for example, using ibogaine from Africa uh, to uh, cure heroin addicts, basically get rid of the cravings by having this intense psychedelic trip so that you're cured with it. But ibogaine can be a poison too if you don't know what you're doing. So that there is that idea about, you know, you could drink something or whatever and then, you know, be able to understand their language. I mean there there is that. You know, understand that what a human baby is, human baby's brain is a computer 
capable of learning every human language that's spoken around it. Automatically formatted to do that. Every language is spoken around it. That's why you see in Africa, people speak in multiple languages without school. I mean, you know, are Africans like super? Well, yeah, we are. But, <laughs> but the idea is every human has that capability because it's the, basically the same DNA. We're the same folks, period. Now, what happens is that we're forced to evolve beyond certain limitations that are defined by our culture because of survival conditions. So when I was talking about, yeah, the 16 year old who's making 10 grand a month, which when I encountered her, which is what more than I was making in a year. Well, obviously, but you know, I was making 10 grand a year and she's making 10 grand a month. What, are you banking that with Bank of America, Wells Fargo? No, you can't. You money, no, right. And a 16 year old can't open up a bank account. You put more than 10,000 in the time you right. have. Right, no, so, you know, how do you survive? You know, having to fly a prombat on San Vicente. Cadillac, paid for a cash, no license. Multiple weapons. Charter a bus to Vegas to pick up product every two weeks. I mean, yeah. What was she selling? Uh, this is what, PCP? Oh, well, that's... This is six months before crack hit that's LA. That's really bad karma. Yeah, sure, right. So, back to slide. So, to enter, you know, so the atmosphere power on Navi. This graphic is basically depicting, you know, the inner, the final interface between, you know, the human and his Navi counterpart. You know, near the end of the movie. So, one of the things you do in an atmosphere of power, if you don't have power within that atmosphere, you make allies or you have assistive technology that helps you overcome that power disability. You need me to say that again? Okay. We are all temporarily able-bodied. Okay? You get old, stuff starts breaking down and you have to start walking with a cane, or a wheelchair, or whatever, right? The cane or the wheelchair is assistive technology when you have a physical disability. Or you start, can't start hearing so well, so you get a hearing aid, assistive technology, right? So the avatar is assistive technology for negotiating this hostile environment. Now you could also have friendly natives Right? And that's what happened with the col colonialism. We have the friendly natives that help the colonizers. They may not intend to do that, but it often happens. That's assistive technology. So the idea is, if you walk into a power environment where they're more powerful than you, what is it you need to learn or do to become as powerful as they are? That's the idea. What's the assistive technology? That's a, the specific language. Right? Because part of my job as a drug counselor is, look, if you are a day clean and sober, you come under the Americans with Disabilities Act. But this is Lane Community College, which is part of Eugene, Oregon, which is part of Lane County, which is a major drug place. Okay, not as bad as New York, but it's there. Meth, heroin, alcohol, weed, it's all there. Assistant. So if you're, you're a person in recovery, and somebody offers you a hit of weed, you know, let's go, you know, off on the nature trail, it's a, you know, smoke, smoke a bowl, or whatever, like, okay, you're trying to stay away from that, how do you do it? Well, there's an office you can go to, my office, which helps you, that's assistive technology, where the assistance is, I'm teaching you how to do that. Because you don't necessarily have to use, develop my worldview which is, look, this is war. 
What did this Drugs and alcohol are a weapon used against my people. This is war. I, you do not make yourself weak before the enemy in, in wartime. What, what does the Assistive Disability Act do for Jinky? Uh, we provide, okay, we got a 12-step meeting. Noon. That's the accommodation. We have somebody especially trained to help you. That's, that's the accommodation for Elaine Community College. That's the assistive technology, as it were. All right? So, and or protective or wear protective gear. So, I see you. You know, that's what they say. The Navi say, I see you. Go back to slide, easier. So, in diunital logic, that is the African native indigenous logic system, the union of opposites, to see through the other's eyes. Uh, this is an Audre Lorde quote. Audre Lorde, um, black lesbian poet and writer. The white fathers told us, I think, therefore I am. The black mother within us Within each of us, the poet whispers in our dreams, I feel, therefore I can be free. Now, there's a con this is the end of a longer piece, which I can share with you if you want, or we can skip on. Want to see the whole context? Because this is deep. I like it. I would. Yeah. So she's talking about writing and poetry. The quality of light by which we scrutinize our lives has a direct bearing upon the product which we live and upon the changes which we hope to bring about through those lives. So she's basically coming from the point of view that everybody, this is an African and indigenous concept, nobody comes into the world without a life purpose, period. You got a mission. Your mission is to discover the mission and bring it out. Make the world a better place than when you came into it, before you leave. That's it, right? So she's talking about that from that context. The quality of light, so that she's talking about a sighted person. So it's not just your physical eyes, but what you can see through your mind's eye and how you illuminate it. How you make the world a better place. The quality of light by which we scrutinize, that is, look very carefully and closely. Your life has a direct bearing upon the product which we live and upon the changes which we hope to bring about through those lives. It is within this light that we form those ideas by which we pursue our magic and make it realized. This right? Yeah. Okay. This is poetry as illumination, for it is through poetry that we give name to those ideas which are, until the poem, nameless and formless, about to be birthed but already felt. So, for example, if I translate this, hip hop is basically sung poetry, but it's not necessarily sung. Sung, it's spoken to a rhythm. But a griot, or jolly, that is the African equivalent, actually they're just more than musicians and poets, they're also historians, they're also diplomats, they're also, we don't really have an English word for it. So what KRS one is? KRS calls himself, you know, Chris calls himself the teacher, and he is, because he's well read and he can speak about it, but that form of rap and hip hop is evolved out of bebop, which was the same thing, except that they were speaking in musical terms, but also writing social commentary like Strange Fruit. Um, let's see, Oscar Brown Jr. has some great pieces about uh, Straighten Up and Fly Right. Yeah, you know, where the monkey jumps on the buzzard's back and fly me out of Mississippi, fly me out of Dixie, straighten up and fly right. Signifying monkey, you know, monkey telling the lion that 
the elephant is dissing him and inducing a fight with the lion and then the lion gets his ass kicked by the elephant and then he goes after the monkey and the monkey says, yeah, you fool, you believe me. So that's why the monkey stays up in the tree all the time and never comes down to mess with the lion because the lion remembers that. But, you know, so I mean, that's jazz, context. that's a bebop context. That's basically social commentary. So hip hop is basically the continuation of four, four to 10,000, if not more, African tradition. Where you're telling a story, you're using poetry, you're using music, you're using rhythm, right? So spoken word happens without rhythm, but the same concept, social commentary, talking about your feelings, et cetera, et cetera, right? So this is what Audrey's talking about, about poetry. Poetry allows us to name the nameless and give it form. So it basically is a creative impulse that comes out of you and you're trying to give a name to this feeling that you're feeling and what is this? So write it out, try and describe it. That's what she's talking about, a creative process that comes within. This is an example of spiritual power, which is one of the elements, there are seven elements that I've identified in an atmosphere of power. The reason I'm teaching you this construct is to look for them. That distillation of experience from which true poetry springs birth, from which true poetry springs, bursts thought as dream births concept, as feelings birth idea, as knowledge births, that is, precedes understanding. So she's saying, poetry is a tool for transforming the world. Because it allows you to bring the unseen world into the scene through words, which are thoughts, representation of thoughts. Like, what are you thinking? What were you thinking? So create a poem out of that. So we're saying that poetry distills spirits, ex distills experience from your spirit. And she's talking about true poetry and she goes on to define that shortly. I speak here of poetry as, as a revelatory distillation of experience. That is, it's a revelation. It's, oh wow, I see the truth, and it's illumined. I see a truth for me. And you distill that truth into a smaller form. Not the sterile wordplay that too often the white fathers distorted the word poetry to me in order to cover a desperate wish for imagination without insight. My commentary. So, poetry is a revelatory distillation of experience. So it's about feeling. You feel me? Like, where did I come from? That phrase, that idea. Hey, out of language, out of you know, hip hop, out of spoken word, all that. Not the sterile word play that too often the white fathers distorted the word poetry to me. So yeah, you can cleverly string words together, sound clever, but what where's the meaning? Where's the heart? Where's the feeling? Poetry is the way we give name to the nameless so it can be thought. As we learn to bear the intimacy of scrutiny and to flourish within it, we, as we learn to use the products of that scrutiny for power within our living, those fears which rule our lives and form our silences begin to lose their control over us. So part of the piece, another famous quote of Audrey's is, your silence will not protect you. 
Okay, and she's talking about within certain power as domination frameworks. So remember I said I used that Wade Nobles quote, you know, power is the ability to define reality so that others respond to your their definition, your definition as if it were their own. And there's two ways of doing that, at least power over. I don't know who you are, but you Indians now or power with. Wherever there are three or more of you gathered in my name, there I am too. Because you and I are the same person. Right? That's empowering. Not power over, power with. Right? So she's saying, you know, people can control you using fear and then the threat of violence. And so, when you're in an abusive situation, you don't speak your truth. Because it could be dangerous. So those fears which rule our lives and form our silences begin to lose their control over us. When we view living in the European mode only as a problem to be solved, we rely solely upon our ideas to make us free. Right? So in the European mode, oh, it's a problem. We solve problems. But if you understand how enantio romeo works, have I used that word yet here? Must have uh, been last, last term. term. <laughs> enantio romeo. It was originally a Greek word, that which arises from its opposite. So, what I taught last time, I guess I should find the uh, slide that talks about it and insert it, but here's how enantiodromia romeo works. Look at our drug policy, we, we, we looked at our drug laws. I was talking about this in the Prevention Coalition this morning. They were saying, oh, we got to do something about marijuana, we got to do something about marijuana. Okay, it's a drug prevention coalition, okay. And I'm saying, okay, look, this was a legal drug up until 1938. Every pharmaceutical house that's in existence today had a medical marijuana preparation. Basically, just an alcohol tincture where you soak weed in it and then you put it in a bottle. Every major big pharma house had medical marijuana up until 1938. Okay? They were used for pain, they were used for cancer, etc., etc., etc. Two, tobacco companies trademarked marijuana cigarettes. So if you understand how corporations work, they're very conservative. They are about the Benjamins. They are not going to get behind something unless they can make it more addictive or it is addictive because they want repeat business and they don't care how much damage it costs. Heroin was in over-the-counter cough syrup. It was the policy in this country, oh, you're a woman? You're hysterical. So let's give you heroin to control your hysteria. I'm not making this up. Okay, so y'all tripping about medical marijuana? Look, Bayer Laboratory has Sativex. Have y'all heard of Sativex? No. Okay, Sativex. Spray 65 milligrams of THC for cystic fibrosis and other nervous conditions involving pain. Available in Canada and Mexico, pretty much everywhere else except here. Medical marijuana pharmaceutical grade. So I'm saying the smart money, because y'all are tripping about, 
oh, well, there's pesticides in the marijuana. Yeah, sure, not in all the grows, just in the Mexican mafia, Russian mafia, Israeli mafia, weed grows, where they're spraying <laughs> their marijuana outdoor growing in the forest service. Now, I'm not saying that Americans don't do that, but the reason the American mar domestic marijuana exists at all is because of N Richard Nixon spraying Mexican and Colombian fields with Paraguay. Right? So, how this is an example of enantiodromia is problems. create solutions, right? So problem creates its opposite, the solutions. Solutions create new problems, <laughs> which generate new solutions, <laughs> new problems, Right, enantiodromia, that which arises from its opposite. And there's a third sense of this, like from last term, the way you see the problem is the problem. Einstein pointed out, you cannot solve a problem from the same level of consciousness that you created it at. You have to expand. Because otherwise you'll keep generating new problems. Right? So the problem with medical marijuana is, look, you need to understand why they made it illegal, and they made it illegal because colors with big lips, you induce white women to have sex with them using jazz and marijuana. Is that... Raci is racism a way to base public policy? Why not that there is a problem that's a health-related problem that's widespread enough so then we impose controls on the drug? Not because black people are having sex with white women. That's stupid. That's why we made it illegal. Not because there was a public health problem. Right? So that's why it can't be changed back because of that political will. But notice what Big Pharma is doing. They're basically doing medical marijuana. You cannot stop that trend. The money is going to legalize it. To make money. Yes, it's addictive. But you need to address the addiction from another level. Create stronger people that don't need it. Ooh. Okay? And that's a spiritual question, which is not being answered by the brands of spirituality you're talking about. What Audrey is talking about, back to slide, okay? When we view living in the European mode only as a problem to be solved, we rely solely upon our ideas to make us free. If you don't have an enlightened idea, you still stuck. For these were what the White Fathers told us were precious. And what do we learn in this form of education? Ideas, and more ideas, and bigger and better ideas, and more complex and pretty ideas. But as we come more in touch with our own ancient non-European consciousness of living as a situation to be experienced and interacted with, that is a more indigenous, African, feminine-centered reality. Notice she's talking about white fathers, she's setting up a dichotomy. We learn more and more to cherish our feelings and to respect those hidden sources of our power from where true knowledge and therefore lasting action comes. White fathers told us, I think, therefore I am. That's Descartes, Rene Descartes. The black mother within each of us, the poet, 
whispers in our dreams, I feel, therefore I can be free. More better? Better context now? Who that? Audrey Lord from her book Sister Outside. All right, back to elements of power. All right, so you see, to, in order to see the other's word, world, the first element in an atmosphere of power to consider is spiritual. That is, the energetic connection that allows you to move freely beyond your limits. So for example, to see transpersonally, that is beyond your personality and your body. To see the other, that's a spiritual quality. It's a skill set. Right? So to see the other's world. So power is the capacity to be effective. Internally, your power is defined by your capacity to know your own unique purpose shape your own destiny in the face of opposition that you find in the world. 